All right, so we will start the presentation. Um, welcome everyone and thank you for joining. Uh, my name is Aaliyah Picanzo and I am the Product Marketing Specialist at Icon. Um, just quickly before we continue, um, I want to start the webinar off by addressing the current COVID-19 situation. I spoke about this in our last webinar, um, but just to recap, first and foremost, I and everyone at Bicon sincerely hope you and your loved ones are staying safe. This is a very difficult time for many, so I just wanted to let you know that Bicon remains fully operational to ensure your operations don't suffer. Our support, our sales team, our warehouse team, um, all continue to work hard around the clock to provide you with any assistance that you may need. Um, at this time, we've decided to focus more on webinars, as many of you are in lockdowns or working from home. So our hope is to begin introducing you to some of the developments we intended to showcase during IC West and to provide you with more insight um, into our upcoming products. Today, we are presenting Vicon Solaris VMS version 20.2, and that will be presented by Guy Arazi, the Director of Product Management at Vicon. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the question box in your GoToWebinar control panel, and we'll go over as many as we can when we're done with our presentation. And we will get into the presentation. So Vicon has been a leader and an innovator in the security industry for over 50 years. These days, we're known for providing end-to-end -end solutions from our video management software, Valeris, to network and analog cameras and our box access control. All of these products can either stand alone or work seamlessly together to give you the ability to customize your security the best way you see fit. So now I'd like to introduce today's presenter, Guy Razi, who is the Director of Product Management at Bicon. We hope you and your loved ones are staying safe and healthy out there. And here's the guy. So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, glad to be here. Get, glad to see some uh, familiar names on the list. And uh, some of you have seen your names on our different webinars. It's always great to see people coming back. Uh, what we're going to cover today in this webinar is we're going to go over uh, a few words about Valeris, the VMS itself, and then jump right into our version 22, which is being released these days, looking at some of the nice features we've added in this version and how this version takes us forward. And we'll end that with uh, just giving you a little look at what's coming next in our next version in 20.3 and so on. Once we're done with that, um, I'll try and take as many questions as the time permits. So please make sure to put those questions in the question uh, area on the system so I can try and read them off as we get there. About Valeris and a few words about what we're doing here. For those of you who are new to Valeris and also for those of you who've uh, uh, not seen our latest versions, Valeris is a pretty unique VMS. And what we're trying to do is to try and offer a browser-based solution, pure browser-based, by the way. And this solution is trying to take these complex uh, things that we do with our VMS and make them easy, however, keep them powerful. What we've done is we built things around standards and looking at it as an open platform to try and make your decision making easier, as well as the way you maintain and go forward with the system. This slide basically represents the ecosystem, which is Valeris, and we're trying to add to this uh, uh, ecosystem the things that make sense to uh, everybody, starting with that thin client architecture that we just talked about, the browser as your client instead of having to install things, catering towards IT and their needs and easier installation and distribution, and going through things like forensic search, mobile apps, analytics, which is a big thing in our world, access control solutions that we offer, and so on. I'm gonna to touch on some of the new things we're doing and you'll see how those fit very nicely into this uh, ecosystem. In this version, in the, really the second release of Valeris 20, we're adding features as we keep going forward to keep the platform powerful, but also 
to fill those gaps for you customers and anybody who needs additional, more powerful, more enterprise, more directed features to achieve what you need. Things like uh, streaming from the mobile devices, from our phones, geo maps, snapshots, and all these things listed here, which I'll go through on the presentation. So without wasting too much time, I'm gonna switch over to my system and let's look at this um, really as a, on, on the live system and not on slides. I don't wanna bore you with slides. So this is our Valeris system. And what I will do is I'll try with the time that we have uh, to get you guys through the major things we've done in this version. And clearly, if you're looking for other information, once more, the question box. I'm gonna start with one of our biggest differentiators and really one of the strong points of uh, Valeris itself, and that is our dashboard. Uh, we've uh, introduced the dashboard in Valeris. Um, sorry. We introduced the dashboard in Valeris as we launched it, but we've uh, done a lot of work since. And in my dashboard, you can immediately see a difference from uh, the dashboard in the former, former versions. One thing that we've uh, got a lot of feedback on and we made changes about is how the dashboard looks primarily when it's used on a big monitor in the control room or things like that that needs to be viewed from a far distance and the indications need to be very clear and very easy to look at. You see, we put these tiles with information for the different components, our app server and NVRs. We're gonna take a dive into those uh, really soon, showing their health criteria. Are they healthy? Are there any warnings? Are there any errors? Uh, you can see this is really our home page for the dashboard is these tiles. And where there are issues will give you a very clear representation uh, with colors and percents of how many errors there's on the system, how many are healthy in this case, two and two out of a total of four cameras. You'll see more when I dive into the details. Let's look at the internals of the application server. And you can see that when we go into the app server's uh, page here, first on the top there, we're showing how many app servers we have one, one is healthy. There are no warnings and errors. And for that below, this tab is empty. We're not showing anything in this tab unless we have warnings or errors and we're trying to keep things clean. So we don't have just information there when there's no issue. Seeing nothing means everything is good. Everything is right and there's nothing really to show. Very clean look. I'm going into the statistics tab for the app server. And here we're sharing statistical information to help you to make decisions when you look at the system. Starting from the left here, a distribution, how many NVRs do we have? One server, you can see that, four cameras. On the right-hand side in this graph, how many different types of cameras do we have in the system? Models of cameras. So you see I have four different models, one of each, and you get a graph of how those are distributed on my system. We have one server, four cameras, it's a quarter each. Down below, two new graphs. Uh, for those of you who know the former dashboard, these graphs didn't exist, RAM and CPU, which give all, uh, an immediate look at how much RAM is the uh, application server machine using, as well as how much CPU it's using. And we're also providing a performance over time graph, hourly and daily for these RAM and CPU details. The importance in these graphs and this information is really the fact that we can now take a look, or really the administrator of the system can take a look at the dashboard and get an indication of how well is the system working based on its resources. Is it running a peak? Uh, is it running at low CPU? Is it running at high RAM or low RAM? Typically will be related to performance. Um, systems that are running at a very high CPU may heat up and work slower. Systems that are eating away at all the RAM may act uh, a little weird. So this is a great indication to know what's going on in terms of how well is my server running? And it's right on the dashboard. Let's continue in the dashboard. And uh, I'm gonna move now and give you a quick look at what we see for the recording servers, the NVRs in the system. 
So again, in the health side of it, all healthy on my NVRs, empty uh, page here, but statistics for NVRs look a little different. I have only one NVR in this demonstration here. So I'm showing you just uh, what it is, and you see a line with a summary. And the first thing that we show here is the NVR name. When's the last time this NVR actually came online? So it's up since this time and date. And that really comes to show you if the NVR restarted or things like that happened, you can see that by the date it got started. How much storage is assigned to this NVR? How many channels are assigned to this NVR video and audio and so on? Clicking on that NVR will take us inside to a similar uh, dashboard page to what we saw for our application server. But right now, these are statistics for the specific NVR. The assigned devices by model happens to be uh, very similar because it's only one NVR. So it's the same as we saw the system wise. But when we go here to the right, this is probably one of the more important graphs that we have here. And that's storage dist distribution by channel. I have about 15 channels of video on my uh, demo system here. And you can see that when you look at my uh, pie chart, you can see per camera, what slice is that camera taking out of the big pie of storage are 68 gigabytes. This one is using a 0.05 of a gigabyte. Others will use less. And by looking at these pies and these slices, we can very quickly identify which channels, which cameras, oops, sorry, which channels and which cameras take more storage than others. Now, this may not mean much. It just may mean that uh, it's taking more storage and it's fine. Or it may mean that for some reason, it's putting in too much storage. Just by looking at that pie, you get an indication of who's one that's taking more storage. And then you can go and look and say, oh, well, this camera, that's fine. Uh, it's uh, supposed to take more storage because it's a high resolution one, or it's in a very busy area, or it's a PTZ that never stops moving. Or maybe it's taking too much storage and I need to go and investigate why, what's going on. Um, I'll mention that again when we look at the camera statistics. Down here for my NVR, a graph, again, daily and weekly, that we can look at how much bandwidth is coming into our NVR and what's being recorded in here, the average and the trends. Once more, if somebody needs to go and look at the system, these trends may be uh, very important. Uh, what's going on daytime versus nighttime versus weekend. Uh, that allows us to see how the bandwidth into this specific NVR behaves and to analyze things behind it. On the right-hand side, we're looking at performance to spec. Either for a standard drive or for a RAID like this, we're giving the graph that will show here, where are we against the spec? For example, we say for a RAID-based system, we can handle per NVR 100 channels or 300 megabit. And here you see that we're far from getting there and it's blue and everything is fine. If this was not so fine, we would turn the graph red to show you where are you exceeding the spec. Down below, very similar to what we saw for the app server, graphs and immediate uh, gauges for RAM and CPU, allowing us to look at trends, what's going on, how well is this NVR working with its resources. And down here, another addition in this version is an NVR latency graph. And what this graph represents or really shows us is um, give or take, called it ping time from the app server to each and every one of the NVRs and gives us an understanding in milliseconds of how well is the network allowing our packets to go through. This is very important in cases where we need to look at things like slow video, choppy video, any type of uh, behavior on the system that may indicate that we have some network difficulties, things are stuttering, packets are potentially getting lost, we will typically see an increase in latency and a graph like this should allow us to start our investigation of what's going on. Certainly if we see that one NVR has low latency and another one has high latency and there's a difference in how they behave, it gives us a way to look at it, compare and debug from it. So a pretty important new graph. Uh, 
Uh, everything here is milliseconds over a one hour, hour period, by the way. So you get a trend over one hour, which in networking time is usually uh, a pretty good time to debug things. Let's go to cameras and I'm bringing to your attention right here, you can see that we have this uh, red triangle that also shows up on our dashboard. And I did create a couple of issues on the system just to show you how they look on the health tab uh, which we saw the word clean was clean on the other ones. Uh, here, out of our four cameras, and we saw that when we were in the home position of the dashboard, we have two cameras with errors. And you can see down here, my two cameras, dot 110, dot 30, both are in a communication failure situation. Uh, basically, I disconnected them. We have a very easy shortcut to get to the device configuration, which it would be a good way to start debugging. It can take us there. and if these come back online, they will disappear from the dashboard. One of the philosophies of our dashboard is good to have a clean dashboard. Any healthy system should really show you nothing on its health monitoring. When we look at the uh, statistics for cameras, we get uh, a longer list. It's all the video channels that we have in the system, not physical cameras. I am using an encoder here in this example. So I have more channels than actual physical devices. And we get a summary showing us the name, which NVR is recording it, what's the recording method. It's telling us what's the earliest and the latest recording for my uh, system. And it's showing us how are things recorded. What expectation do we have of the recording? If I designed my system to have 90 days of recording, I can say expected 90 days. Here I have zero, I have really no uh, definition of what's expected. We're working in FIFO. Our estimated retention for this channel is less than one day, and we're getting a check mark for healthy retention because uh, we specified zero days is what I need. I'm getting less than one day, but it's still more than zero, so it's still in the green. And that would show that for any camera. Clicking on a camera, any of these cameras will take us into the statistics for those cameras. Here on the left, the graph of recording expected versus estimated, because I had zero in there, we're not showing anything on this graph. If I had an expected 90 days or anything like that, we would show what's the expected versus what's uh, being um, calculated by the system right now as uh, estimated versus expected. On the right-hand side, another bandwidth graph. So I'm just taking you Two steps back to when we talked about that camera taking a bigger pie piece of the pie uh, in our storage than others this would be a very good way to look at it and go okay i can take a look at that channel that camera and see what bandwidth is that camera putting into the nvr and we have a graph like before daily or weekly with an average telling us what's coming into uh, the system what's being recorded and can allow us to see what's going on uh, for example, in, uh, when I did this, March 19th, I had 3.5 megabit per second, and March 21th, I had zero, almost nothing. Uh, was this because the system went down offline? Maybe the camera specifically went offline? This gives us a good trend and a way to see how bandwidth, which is video from the camera, was coming into the system. The next item, Internet Gateway, that's a component we have in Valeris allowing to connect to the Internet. There's nothing really going on here. And you'll notice there's no statistics tab for the Internet Gateway. It's just uh, a component. We do um, have it here because we want to let you know if it's online or something is wrong. Uh, so you can potentially get some health monitoring through it. But in this example, I didn't uh, even set it up. It's just present. And the next one is a new entry completely. To our dashboard and that the cybersecurity tab. Now, a quick word about cybersecurity. This is a growing topic. Obviously, all of you see uh, the concerns with cybersecurity and the requirements from the IT community. And we are starting to put more and more attention and measures to Valeris uh, to report and to help as part of this dashboard information with what's going on cybersecurity wise. We're starting here with a clean slate. There's no indication of errors, nothing like that. And if I now go and show you the statistics tab for uh, uh, my cybersecurity, you can see that uh, at this time, all we do in statistics 
uh, let me just let it load, is we give you a list of the people that are signed into the system, what username, which machine are they logged in from, that's my local machine here, how long have I been logged into the system, and even what time I logged in, and there is an action option here to kick this user out. I'm, I'm going to show you that uh, in an example right now. So I'll actually uh, go ahead back to health monitoring, and let's expand that a little bit, and I'm going to log in uh, to the system from my other computer here, on the same network, uh, and you can already see that orange triangle showing there, and I'm going to use the same user. What we've added here is an option to give you uh, a, an alert or a health monitoring indication, and you see this is a warning, it's not an error, it's not something critical, but it's still pretty important to know, same username is being used from two different machines. Right here, we're showing that it's logged in from Guy Windows 8. Uh, don't worry, I upgraded since, it's still the name of my computer, and also from my laptop, which is Guy Surface. So this, in our minds, is a potential cybersecurity breach with somebody maybe giving his username to someone else, and now you got two locations using the same username. I can use the shortcut and go into the users and start debugging. And if I look at statistics, I now see these two lines. Before we had the first one, top one, now we have two of them. So you do get an indication of which one was logged in when, how long, and so on. And I can go here and kick a user out as part of my investigation from that other machine to allow him uh, really to get uh, out of the system and go there and look at, hey, dude, why are you using this username? Uh, you shouldn't be doing that. There's a lot of planning and a lot of things we want to put into the dashboard as we keep going. This is really just the beginning. I'm going to mention that when we talk about our next revision and some of the things we want to expand, but we are looking to do that. So soon as the dashboard resamples, it's possibly can take up to 30 seconds. This message is going to go away. We're going to keep going now and look at some other things. So the next thing I want to touch on, we'll go to some of the smaller but pretty important things uh, that we have. I'm going to go into configuration and jump into our maps area. Maps have been there before, but we've added some things here. And we start by looking at uh, this existing maps. And what we've been doing with these is loading in static maps, uh, JPEG form or a PNG form type static maps, and we can lay things over them and do things. I just zoomed out. What we've added in this version is something that was grayed out before. You can see there uh, below, I'll just name it uh, Geomap. I'm going to go and click that. And what we're doing here is we're actually connecting to an online mapping server similar to Google Maps if you want to look at it that's this way. Adding a new map starts in the world. I can drill down into the map using my mouse, just scroll in, find the locations I need, or we provide a search window up here where I can go and uh, type in a location, and we'll do a little tribute to Manhattan uh, with everything going on over there, and look for the Statue of Liberty. Everything that we can find here, we can click, and it's going to be a shortcut that takes us right to where we need to be. You can see Liberty Island, and if I zoom out a little bit, uh, you can actually see that the map is there. You can see the tip of Manhattan. We're going to look at that in a minute, but this is a live online map, which I'm getting refreshed as I move around. It's not static. It's not a picture that I snapped and put into the system. I can put myself where I want to be and then set it as my home position. So next time this map opens up, uh, it's going to open in the position that we picked. It's not going to go back to the world. I just set it up. Like we do with the static maps, I can now start laying things on the map. My cameras is uh, the clear example. I can put my camera on it. I can direct it. Um, let's uh, turn it around a little bit so it actually looks at the island there. I'm going to click here and move it. I can uh, play around with the field of view so it really shows what the coverage area of the map is. And that's the same as I can do on static maps. I can also link to other maps. So I can use this as my high-level map. For example, if I'm doing a city, that can be my high-level map so it stays online. And I can link like this, uh, take a shape, pick the map that I want to link to. Let's take Long Island. 
and take my shape, my link shape, and this makes uh, very little sense. So I'm actually going to go and change that. And instead of using a square, I'll do an arrow pointing to Long Island. I'll just turn it around a little bit. And this arrow is linked to the other map. So I'm going to go to monitoring and show how that looks uh, right away. Let's jump there and see how this thing looks to the operator on the monitoring side of things. Map loads, home position is what we set up. And you can see the map is there. And I can hover over the camera like I would on a static map and get uh, a view of what's going on there on the lawn. Uh, I can use my link in the arrow and it jumps to the next map where I can do other things and go back. Back at the map, I can still, it's a still a live map. So if I start zooming out like this, you can see that it's still connected to the real map and I can start uh, making my way into Manhattan and zooming in and getting all the street information and the data and everything that you may need from that. We still have the search option up here. So if I now want to search for something in this area or not in this area, it's still available for me. Let's do Times Square, which should be a little uptown there. And I get the indication and it's going to fly right up there and zoom into Times Square. Times Square, right now pretty empty, but uh, this map being online will get updates. So if there be strict closures and things that the map gets updated to, you will get them. That's the advantage of being online, of course, with a map. A uh, important point here is that to use these geo maps, the system has to have internet access. This is not a local server. This is a live server on the internet, a real mapping solution that we're using up here. I'm going to keep going forward. Um, I'm going to now show another new feature. And I pulled over this uh, golf uh, course uh, camera, and you can see that in the middle we have uh, this pixelated masking that I put on. And this is a mask we generate in the VMS. Uh, we're, we're there to show that this now has, uh, I want to go into the mask configuration just to show you. You can see I'm removing the mask and put it back, but the configuration is the important part. We added in the masking option uh, a way to control this mask's opacity and how it really covers things and then looks. So if I go into my mask settings there, new edition and this version, mask setting, you can see that I can decide whether my mask is pixels, like uh, what you've seen before, or is it a solid mask? Let's start with the pixels and you can see that we control the pixel sizes, five being my middle and also my default. And I'll change the pixel size quickly to one, one pixel, one size, that is just sizes one to 10 same picture as before, you can now see that there's a bit of a blur where that mask was very noticeable before. It's the same mask. I didn't change it, but I did change the pixel size. And this allows us to really see uh, human beings. You actually can see the shape. You can pretty much tell the color of what they're wearing. You will not be able to see, to tell uh, their identity because it's still blurred by the pixels, but it's not as blurred as it was before. So the pixel size makes a big difference in how blurry that becomes. Let's just jump right back in there. I'm going to take it to the opposite. So instead of one, I'll go to 10. That's the maximum pixel size. And uh, just so you can see back on the same video, how much of a difference it makes. Really big pixels, you can't even tell People are behind these. You, you can see a bit of a change. You can see these flickers going on, but the blur here is extremely, extremely higher. Uh, depending on your distance from the object, the camera's zoom level, uh, what you're looking at and things like that, the ability to control the pixels is very important. And if you need to really cover things, the solid mask is still there. It's a gray as an option, but uh, if we need better contrast, uh, I can go and pick, uh, I don't know, a blue shade. So it goes against the, uh, the lawn over there in my golf course, and I can have it completely hidden. Unlike the pixels, it's solid. There's no opacity at all, and you can really not see anything through it. What's important to always remember is that if you have the right credentials in the system in Valeris, you can unmask right from here and see what's going on behind the mask, whether it's live or if it's playback. So this mask is not 
part of the recording, it's overlaid, and with the right authorization, you can remove it. The next thing I'd like to show is uh, another addition in this version we call snapshots. So when we're looking at images and things like that, many times there's a need to go and create a snapshot of that image. And you can see this new button called snapshot. When I'll press it, uh, you will see a quick indication of where the snapshot gets saved and a little preview about five seconds and it dissolves. I'll do it again just so you can see how it looks. We are creating a JPEG image and saving it at your designated storage location. And this is done for live, but I'm going to open the timeline and uh, jump into playback just so you can see that the same logic of taking a snapshot and uh, saving it to somewhere can be done for playback. If you're doing forensic work and you're playing back and finding a suspect and you want to save, you can do that in the same way. I'll create a couple and uh, I'll show you how they look in their uh, in storage location right away. So the snapshot option is also also comes with ability to set some uh, um, some things per user. In the user settings here, you see we have these snapshot settings added, and there's a few things we can control. One is where do we save them to? In my case, I'm saving them to my desktop. I do have permission to save there. Of course, you need to have right permissions. Another thing we allow is to decide what is the prefix that uh, comes with a snapshot. So it the default is snapshot, but I can change that. Uh, we'll put demo here just as an example. A uh, format that will save JPEG, PNG, and TIFF are supported. So depending on your needs, JPEG will be your typical one, I guess. And how do we number them? Is it a date and timestamp or is it a sequence? In some places, a sequence number, one, two, three, four, five, et cetera, are more desired. So I'll save those and uh, I'll snap a couple more just so you can see the differences between the settings. That's good enough. And I'll minimize that. And because it's all on my desktop, I'm gonna share my uh, messy desktop with you. And you can see how these snapshots look. So let's take a look at a few of these. Uh, this first one, you can see it's snapshot seven, that prefix was snapshot. This was the seventh. This was when we were doing sequence number let's pick another one snapshot with a date so the date and time but i still use that snapshot as my uh as my header as my prefix for the names there's one more date and time snapshot uh and i changed to demo so let's see where that demo ended up uh there it is once we called it demo you can see it was still date and time, but the prefix was changed to demo. So there's good control of what's going on over here. And the JPEG is created from the image that uh, that you're snapping from. So this was a 4K image, the snapshot the JPEG is created at that uh, resolution, and you can now attach it to an email. You're just gonna report, do what you need to do with it. I'll go back uh, in here so we can continue. So next here is, uh, let's go into the search tab and a really, really strong addition that we did in this version is a powerful audit log that we added. And I, it opens up and you can see, and remember that Valeris is a centralized system. Everything is using one server, all the clients are reporting to one server. So all the audit information goes to that same server. And you can see a pretty long list of uh, information here, the user, the time and date, uh, the machine being used, the action that this was actually tagging and uh, pretty much every clickable action in the system gets tagged and logged in our audit log. There's certain ways to go through this, uh, through this log. You can just scroll through, but it will become pretty big pretty quickly. We can uh, use on the top left here, uh, our search window and actually search for certain text. For example, if I put in logout, it's gonna filter everything and I can go and look at the, all the logout actions I have in the system. You see the familiar name of my computer and some usernames and so on. Let's clean this. We do allow to pick a time and date range. The audit log holds up to 90 days right now. We do have filters here. If I don't wanna see everything, I can say which computer am I interested in? 
if I know I'm looking for logs for actions created on guy surface or on another machine, VLR 1188, whatever, I can go and click those and the list will filter to show those. And it is a multiple, so we can do more than one. And I can also specify which user. I can do them all, or I can say, oh, I'm only interested in actions taken by the user guy. Uh, the reset button just clears everything. It puts you back to step one. I'm going to do this just for my uh, surface, just so we have a list in control, because I want to show you how can we export this information to a usable report. So there's two formats. One is an HTML format, which will really create a browser uh, openable report. You can take it around, you can email it, and it will open in browsers, and it's nice and neat. The second one, which is very powerful, is Excel. I'm creating an actual Excel file, so I'm going to save it here, but clearly to open an Excel file, I have to have Excel installed on my computer. So I happen to have it, and you can see that the same report gets exported into Excel. I can play around with the column with I can sort things in Excel, I can write uh, macros in Excel if I know how to do those, and I can really do pretty much anything you can in Excel with this information. So if you need to show a report to someone after you created it and sort it and mark things up and uh, maybe even save it as a PDF at the end of it, it's very easy to do from Excel. So audit log, just uh, before I keep going, obviously a strong addition in this version allowing you to go and track user actions around the systems in a very quick and very accessible way. Now what I want to share with you is uh, one of I, was, I think the coolest, I don't know if it's the strongest, probably the coolest features that we've added in this version and this is the ability to use my cell phone as not only an application that can connect to Valeris and view Valeris and uh, uh, be a little viewer on the go, is also to use the cameras that we have in these uh, phones and connect them to Valeris back. To do that, we need to add the phone into the system. It's done through the uh, add manual here. And I'm going to actually look at the, the device type. I have an option for mobile device. Both Android and iOS through our app can be added. I need to provide the media server IP. The media server is a new server we created that knows how to talk to the phones on one hand and feed that information into Valeris on the other. This media server is an installation that is now part of uh, this version. Port to connect to, name for the device, and the phone ID. This phone ID is really important. The phone ID is the identifier of my personal or your personal device in the system because we don't want anyone with a cell phone to be able to connect. So I want to show you how that looks. And for that, I'm sharing my phone screen now. Oh, I got 50% battery. That's great. We can go forever. And I'm going to log uh, into Valeris because I need to show you what we did with that phone ID. How do you get it? And what changed on the app to make this whole thing work together? So I'll log in the same usability of the app to get video, to look at video, all this is uh, obviously the same. We did add it the app a little bit. It is a nicer looking solution right now. And you can see here in the settings, I just switched in, we have some information about uh, live stream resolution, how, how much bandwidth do I have? How much am I gonna push from the phone back? What's my media server IP? Where am I connecting to the port? We do offer ways to work on wireless or from the internet or both. And down below here, you can see that ID, my phone ID, this is a unique number. Every phone is gonna have a unique identifier, which we'll use to register it in the system with. And this way we know that only this phone is allowed to connect and is gonna connect. I'm gonna click my start streaming button there. And you can see that it turns my screen to my camera. This is looking out my window here. And you can see that it's giving me uh, the image of my backyard looking down. It's kind of the end of the day. And I'll close this just to show you how it looks here. I'll show you how the video looks in, in Valeris itself in a second. That identifier that we picked up is right here. The media server IP on my machine, the name is mine, 
OnePlus is my model, my phone, and everything is right now disconnected. I stopped streaming. I'm going to go and show you how this looks on the other side, on our monitoring side. Once it's in there and it's working, but before that, I wanted you to see that like everything else in Valeris, it's a video channel resource. It has certain properties that uh, we can work with. Right now, it's disconnected. When I'm showing it, I can name it whatever I need. I can set up the recording parameters for it, what comes in, but I can't really set up the streams because it's a phone. It's not an Onviv dual streaming camera. We just gray this out. We grayed out the 360 D warp, not relevant here. And I can do uh, the other things with the phone. So it's really a video resource in Valeris like anything else. I'm going to drag it over. See, it's down there, guys, phone camera. Let's drag it over. And it's going to try and connect. And while it does that, I'm going to click that start streaming button again. So we get the stream. Um, same view out my window, but now you can see it's coming into Valeris. I'm using a D1 resolution. I could use a little more. I could use a little less depending on bandwidth. I am on wireless. So latency wise, uh, this is really, really nice. And the big thing here is really that we're recording this like any other camera in Valeris. We get the timeline. You see where it's been recorded. We get snapshots when we hover. I can go into playback mode. I can export this video like I can do any other camera in Valeris. So from, call it the roaming guard perspective, uh, if I have a guard that's walking around with his uh, cell phone and he sees something going on, I did, by the way, just stop streaming. You can see the timeline stopping and we're going into connecting. The roaming guard that walks around and sees something that may be very important either for him when he goes back into the control room, he can open his phone and send it back, or maybe there's people in the control room that he can transmit video to and uh, they're going to see what he sees as a tactical means. This is a really, really simple and effective way to do that with Valerius. This is really the highlights of this version and the things that we added. I'm going to switch back to the PowerPoint here. And I want to talk a little bit uh, before we go to questions. I am looking at my watch and we're still in good time. Uh, I am going to talk a little bit about where are we taking all these capabilities and where is this going? So there's two things that we do kind of side by side. One is we keep servicing our base our users and their requirements, the existing features and how we can make them better, uh, and, and trying to work those through as we keep developing bigger stuff. On the right-hand side are bigger milestones in what we do in this version, and I'll cover them uh, right now. So more integrations. Uh, license plate recognition is coming in the next round. We have a couple of partners that were bringing in and they'll be uh, tied into Valeris. We're doing additional ones. Focus will be more than likely uh, access control, our VAC system and some others. And we are really, really putting resource to more and more integrations and bigger partnerships than ever. Some little uh, things that we were asked for, uh, the reporting in Valeris, we asked that when you put, we provide our ESMADE report, which channels are where, what's the names and all that, We'll add a snapshot so somebody that has that report can also take a look and know what that camera is covering from a video perspective. We want to enhance our bookmarking capabilities, multiple cameras at the same time, synchronizing the bookmarks and other things. We want to add some additional tagging on our timeline so you can see events on the timeline and have better tags and access from the timeline directed to those. And we are adding more and more dashboard information. Uh, You've seen what we added now. We're putting a lot of uh, effort towards the dashboard. We want to be able to provide indications in cyber for uh, users that are trying to attempting to log in too many times with the wrong password. Uh, users logging in from machines that have been blacklisted or uh, on the other hand, creating a whitelist for machines. Uh, users that did not change their admin password. Things like that are a big uh, growth for us and we're looking to do more in that regard and other statistics and more on uh, uh, the other servers as well. On the bigger milestones on the right-hand side there, big effort to change the player, the component that's showing the video here, to a new HTML-based player, HTML5-based player, actually. 
And the biggest achievement in this is going to be the ability for us to offer a cross-platform and cross-browser solution. Today, we're limited to Windows and we're limited to uh, IE 11. Uh, with this new player, there is no limitation anymore. We expect to be running on Windows, Mac, and Linux, and also on any kind of browser, Chrome, Firefox, uh, Safari, all those should be able to do and give you the same Valeris experience no matter the platform or the browser. That's a big effort for us, but it's going to take Valeris pretty, pretty uh, far in terms of its flexibility. Uh, another big milestone here is alarm management, where we're going to be putting uh, an alarm console in front of the operator, allowing you to go through journal of alarms, jumping to other alarms, setting them by priorities, responding to them, reviewing them, uh, acknowledging them, and doing a lot more with the actual alarm management. Auto archiving, another big one, uh, allowing the system to do two types of automatic archivings of the recording, from a near site in the NVR to a far site, which could be a data center, it can be the NAS in uh, IT, it can be a cloud storage, uh, and we want to move the data from the local NVR to that long-term storage. Uh, depending on how it's set up, it may be a longer term, it may be just a lower cost on all kinds of ideas. Two ways what we're going to be offering. One would be archiving all the data. So, for example, every night at midnight, move the last day's recording to the alternate location. The second one, which is meant for uh, situations where there's either less bandwidth or less storage uh, resources in that remote site, we can also do an archive only around events. So if we set the system, for example, to tag all the motion detection events that happen during the, um, the night, we can then decide that the following morning at 6 a.m., we archive all the video around those events. Two minutes before events, two minutes after the events, only that's going to go and get archived. And this way we save both on transfer bandwidth and on storage on that other side. So very flexible thing. And what we're doing behind the scenes is keeping these in a way that even though the recording may not be on the local storage, it's on the remote, playback and getting to those is still going to be very intuitive. There's not going to have, be a need to say, well, I'm looking for recording, but I know it's not here, so I need to play it back from somewhere else. We will have Valerius go and find that information, if it exists, either on the local or on the remote, and uh, prioritize it. And following the logic of what we're doing with the uh, mobile phones right now, we also are planning to start supporting uh, live streaming video from drones as well as GoPro devices, which are wearable cameras in many cases, and allow them to come into Valeris, very similar to what you saw there with the mobile devices, creating a, a much more robust solution for roaming guards and if you're doing your using uh, drones to get your video. So really, really powerful stuff. In parallel to all of that, just big efforts that are happening kind of in the background, they're not directly related to the next version, like uh, the former slide, but we have a couple of really big projects going on. We are taking a very hard look at cloud solutions, and in many, many ways. Uh, we mentioned cloud storage, that's a, that's a big start, but also cloud services, uh, returning channels, and other things. We will have more to talk to you about as we keep going, but this is a big effort for us. Second thing that we're looking at is updating our in Valeris Analytics, uh, getting stronger AI-based solutions into the platform that will be part of it. Uh, again, as we keep going and keep progressing, this will become more from R&D kind of uh, big brain projects to things that we can share and show and discuss. So with that, I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to open the Q&A uh, or the, the Q. Uh, what is my questions tab? I am not seeing the questions. There it is. All right. 
So I'm going to go through the questions and I'm going to try and answer in the about 10 minutes we have as much as I can uh, around uh, the questions that I can answer here. So one question here, will this new version show not only encoders issues, issues being uh, problems on the encoders, but also specific camera connected to that encoder? So yes, we did add one uh, event into in the system where a camera that gets disconnected from an encoder, say we have a 16 channel encoder, which we, we offer, and one of the cameras uh, disconnects, whether it's a physical issue or even if uh, there's just a video loss or transmission issue, we did add an event now uh, that will tell you there's no recording for that specific channel. So yes, this, this is a new thing in this version. If a camera goes offline, how can I play back video to see when it went down prior to reconnecting? Uh, so a camera that goes offline, if you look at the timeline, that red timeline that we're showing on Valeris, uh, you will see a gap. And if you open that calendar that we have there, you can see a gap and you can see when it went offline and when it came back and uh, recorded and didn't record. There's also now with uh, the fact that we have an event that will tell you that there was a recording issue, you can go and pull a report of all the times cameras reported that, uh, uh, that recording problem and look around the time that that happened. Uh, can we export tables and graphs from the dashboard? Right now, no, um, the, the, the dashboard still doesn't have a way to create a report out of it. It is something that we're looking to add as we go forward. You can capture the screen uh, if that helps, but uh, we don't have a reporting tool yet. So I got some questions. I'm not sure. Would that show in the data logs as well? And can we create instant warnings? I'm not sure what is this relating to. There is a question a little less related. Does the thermal radar, I uh, wasn't showing that, but does the thermal radar that we offer uh, provide body temperature? Uh, it, it provides an object temperature. It's not really meant for to take temperatures if we're talking about things like we see today with COVID, uh, with body temperature. So it will give you a temperature, but it's not uh, accurate for taking a temperature. Um, let's keep going. When you export video, is there a way to put a timestamp on those exported videos? So the videos that we export, uh, are exported in MP4 format and there is no timestamp there. If you play those videos with our uh, video player that comes out uh, or it gets created with the export, it will show you the timestamp. Uh, if you play it as just a standard MP4 uh, on uh, VLC, for example, or anything like that, there will not be a timestamp. Do you need to purge the audit log? Worried about using too much space? That's an excellent question. Uh, no, the, the audit log itself has a FIFO mechanism. So it has room uh, in our database for 90 days. We're not gonna exceed that. It's not gonna eat much more than that. And in 90 days, it's gonna start uh, uh, FIFO, basically deleting the oldest record and writing. So you always have a maximum of 90 days, no need to purge. Uh, so yeah, we have a question. Can we share the presentation? Uh, we will share uh, a link to the webinar and all uh, the presentation with it for sure. And we'll also share answers to the questions uh, with that. Can Valeris show the location of a mobile phone on the map? And is it recording the video from that device? Uh, so we can put an icon on the map right now of that mobile device. It will not move. And now that we added the geomaps and the fact that the phones clearly have a GPS with them uh, will allow us to do that, but we didn't implement that yet. The idea is obviously to get the GPS coordinates and have that icon kind of walk around on the map and show where it is. We're not there yet. Is
is there an option to show uh, when there's motion on a camera, uh, when you have them set up for motion without looking at museum search? So uh, now in this, uh, in this revision, uh, you can go and get a report of all the times you had motion on a camera um, and get it as a report format based on uh, motion detection. So that's available even in the existing released version, by the way, but uh, will work here as well. Any plans to add more details to permission selection for the user configuration? For example, I'm being asked, can we somehow restrict the user from closing the web browser or adding tabs and video streams? Uh, yes, we do, we do know that we need to enhance uh, how we approach this, uh, uh, the control. Uh, we are planning to add authorization so a user will be kind of uh, uh, read the only user if you th think about it and will not be able to uh, to drag cameras over to make changes. Closing the browser window is not something that we can restrict with uh, with permission. Uh, browsers don't really allow that. Um, we, we need to think about is there a way to do that. I'm going to take uh, one more question and then we need to summarize. We're getting to the end of our time here. Uh, can we send an event via email and a snapshot? So we can send an event via email right now without a snapshot. That's another thing on our roadmap to achieve as we go uh, forward. Uh, last question, because it's really interesting. Valeris uh, currently cannot record with a NAS uh, or not use a mapped drive on the network. That's correct. That is on uh, one of the things that will be resolved in release number three. Uh, I didn't list it on the slide, but it is part of what we will be releasing. So there's uh, quite a few more questions. I'm going to, uh, because of the time, I'm going to actually collect those and provide all of you, you get from us uh, with the other information. We'll give you the entire QA uh, on, on a document so you can see that. I appreciate it. I apologize for those of you who I didn't get to the question but it is time for me to uh, give this back to Aliyah so we can uh, summarize. And thank you so much for your time and your patience and stay healthy. Hi everyone, thank you so much for attending. Um, as Guy mentioned, all the questions will be sent out after this webinar along with a link to the recorded video. Um, and if you have a moment and are interested in Valeris, uh, please visit our website for some exciting promotions that we have. Um, thank you all once again. Stay safe.